Welcome to Learning Photography with Duck. Here's your host, Duck. Hey everybody, thank you for joining me once again to Learn Photography with Duck. This is our uh, Lightroom edition. I should probably have that up on screen there. Uh, today what we're going to be doing is we're going to cover some of the uh, changes that occurred with the latest upgrade in Adobe Lightroom Classic. Uh, in particular, uh, there's two major parts that I'm going to be talking about because the upgrade wasn't as extensive as the previous upgrade. If you all recall, the last time you upgraded your, your Lightroom, there were a lot of little goodies. Uh, one of the things that I've always been asking for every time Adobe sends out a survey has finally been incorporated into Lightroom, and I'll be discussing that. Uh, also, if you have the photography bundle that comes with Photoshop, uh, you're probably aware that Photoshop also did a very large uh, overhaul on their system. And in that particular case, there's a lot of stuff. So I hope you'll join me next Monday uh, as we go over all the new things that Adobe has put into the latest version of Photoshop, which is Photoshop 21, uh, even though it came out in 20. It's going by the, the, uh, um, the update number, not by the year. So uh, we are actually in Lightroom 10, I believe it is officially, Lightroom 10. So anyhow, uh, the one thing I, before we get into that, I want to uh, just let you know, also coming up at the end of this month, the fourth Monday, um, I've, I belong to a couple of Facebook groups and, and I know a bunch of you are also in some of these groups. And in particular, there's a, a few groups that deal with uh, uh, models, uh, you know, people who uh, put themselves out there into these groups saying, hey, you know, uh, if you need a model, I'm available for you. And uh, photographers can log on to these groups and say, hey, I need a model for such and such. So it's, it's a nice way of collaborating uh, between uh, a, f a photographic artist and a model and coming together. Uh, but they're, you know, in talking with some models uh, and in, in conversation with a few photography friends of mine that deal with models, uh, there's a lot of miscommunication, a lot of uh, expectations that aren't met. So I put out a little call and say, hey, uh, would anybody be interested in having a discussion about what the basic protocols are, uh, what the expectations are, uh, and what is expected both from the model and from the photographer in these situations. And I got a pretty damn good response saying, hey, yeah, you know, we'd love it if you did something like that. So I scheduled it for um, the 23rd, uh, same bad time, same bad channel. It'll be right here. So if you are a photographer that uh, deals with models or is interested in possibly expanding and, and doing people photography and you want to uh, look to getting a model off of the internet, uh, you might want to attend that. So that way you get a little bit of uh, behind the scenes uh, uh, information on how to deal with uh, these Facebook models. So hopefully you'll join me. But anyhow, what we are here to do is discuss Lightroom and all the new additions that Lightroom has implemented with the latest update. Now, if you have updated already, you will notice that, the, that Lightroom has asked you to update your uh, catalog as well. Uh, because of the changes that were implemented, uh, the way uh, a catalog works is it logs 
whatever specific changes you make to an image, it, it keeps it in a small little text file, All right? And that text file is works around a, a, a database, okay? And of course, if you know how databases work, every time there is a modification to the content that needs to be tracked, the underlying database structure needs to be changed as well. And uh, with this latest edition of, photo, of uh, Lightroom, they made some changes that require that kind of an update. So uh, rather than just inserting a couple little lines, they, re, they are basically rebuilding the catalog. So what they do is they import everything, append the new uh, bits of information that are needed, and create a new catalog. So what you're gonna have is two versions. And if, I, if memory serves me, I think it, it gives you the option to delete your old catalog. Um, I should have made a note of that, but I didn't, and I apologize. But I would suggest don't delete your old catalog just in case, all right? It's always better to be safe than sorry. However, uh, in the past, what I've noticed, you know, and I've been using Lightroom since version three. So that's, you know, way back when. And every time there was an update, uh, either within the version or from one version to the next version, it always created a new catalog. So what I ended up happening uh, early on is I would get multiple catalogs just taking up space on my system. Uh, so, you know, uh, over the years I learned, hey, you know, once I know everything is working good, I'll go back and delete that old catalog. So that's what I would suggest to you is just, you know, it's going to take whatever name your current catalog is, it's gonna take whatever name that is, and it's just gonna append a V10 at the end of it for version 10. That way, when you look at it, uh, you know, uh, uh, through your like file explorer, you will be able to tell which version is which. Now, uh, some people work with multiple catalogs. Uh, I used to, I don't anymore. I find it, you know, uh, a lot more difficult switching back and forth simply because every time you switch catalogs, Lightroom has to close and restart. Uh, you know, unfortunately, Lightroom doesn't have a hot switch from one catalog to the other where you can just say, hey, you know, stop using this one, just go to this one without closing everything down. Um, so I, I stopped using the multiple catalogs. I used to have one catalog that was uh, for clients only and another catalog that was for everything else. Uh, I've since combined the two and I just find it easier to uh, divide my, where my images reside on different drives, but the catalog is one big, huge catalog. So uh, anyhow, that being said, uh, just realize that uh, your new catalog, uh, when it comes to update, it's going to let you know what it's doing. It's going to uh, also offer you the chance to rename it if you want to, but by default, it's gonna use your old catalog name and just append a V12, uh, V10, okay? All right, <clears throat> now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that happens is every once in a while, Adobe will send out a little uh, survey, and I'm sure, uh, you know, at one point or another, you have received one or multiple of these surveys. Every single time I get one of these surveys and they, and they ask you, what, what feature would you like to see implemented? I have always, always, always said, I would love to have live view 
in my tethering, all right? Now, as you know, I am a product photographer. So that means when I'm setting up a product to shoot, I would love to be able to be at the position of my product looking back at a monitor that is looking through the camera showing my setup so that I can manipulate things on my little setup live without having to constantly run back behind the camera, look through the, the viewfinder. Oh, that's got to move. Come back, make the change, come back, look through. Big pain in the ass. So I've always wanted that live view feature. All right. Now it's available with the uh, Canon software that comes with, you know, the, the Canon cameras. But in order to use that, I had to play all kinds of uh, jumping through hoops in order for that to play nice with Lightroom. And it's just a big pain in the ass. Finally, Lightroom says, hey, you Canon people, we're going to give you light, live view. Unfortunately, it's Canon only right now. But I will bet my house that they will be adding Nikon and Olympus and Sony and all the other cameras uh, down the road. Okay? So uh, if you do not have a Canon camera and you say, well, you know, that doesn't work for me, don't worry, I, I can almost guarantee that they will be adding that feature to other camera brands as well, all right? So anyhow, the way it works, if, uh, and this is, you know, even though I tell you I'm a product photographer, if you do any kind of tabletop photography, whether it's still life or whatever, or if you want to take a selfie of yourself, all right? without having to take a lot of images and, and look at them and say, oh man, I, I was in the wrong position or whatever. You can view yourself, turn the screen towards you. You can view yourself, compose yourself, get yourself looking really good in the frame, then click the, the shutter release with a remote shutter, okay? So that's another option. All right, so this is... Uh, let me go over to the way it goes is you go file tethered capture and start the tether capture which is going to bring up a little dialog box now <clears throat> uh, i've always uh, explained to people that when it comes to certain things i tend to be what i call what i term a lazy photographer all right, but it's not that I'm lazy, it's just that I want certain things automated so that at the time of the shoot, I don't have to do a lot of thinking. And this is one of them. So I have a folder set up on my, on my drive that is specifically just to capture tethered images, all right? And it's labeled hashtag tethered. Why? Because it lets me know what the purpose of that folder is. And the hashtag floats it to the top of the stack. All right. And then from there, all I have to do really is just type in whatever keywords I want applied to that set of images that I take at that particular time. All right. So in this case, you know, uh, we're going to do a test and we're going to say, okay. And that's going to bring up, first of all, it's going to switch us over to our uh, tethered folder. And it's going to bring up this uh, um, utility bar. And this controls your camera. Now, the nice thing about tether capturing, and I'm not sure if you were aware of this, but you can have multiple cameras activated in your tether. So if you want to use two cameras, 
you know, for example, maybe uh, one looking down on your product and one overhead shot. You can set up two cameras. You can only operate one at a time, but all you gotta do is come to where your camera is listed. There's a little drop down, and you can switch to all the other cameras that are attached at that time. Of course, they have to be on their own USB cable with their own USB port, okay? From here, uh, like normal, you can control your shutter, you can control your aperture, your ISO, your white balance, uh, any import presets that you wanna uh, attach to it. But what's new is this right here. We have uh, a button that now says live. All right, and again, I apologize, but this is only for Canon people, all right? And it's only for Canon cameras that they've added to, to this system. I don't know if it's all Canon cameras, all right? Uh, I have several Canon cameras, and so far it's worked with my, my 6D, my 7D, and my uh, 5D, all right? You uh, click on Live, and it's going to give you a live view of your setup, okay? And from here, the other thing that you will notice is as soon as you go live, uh, you have the ability to control your focus. All right, so you can do a live focus right from your uh, computer, okay? Once you have, uh, all right, once you have this up, you can then, like I said, you angle the screen so that you can see it, and then you can walk over. You can walk over into your scene manipulate your scene as as you want and because you're seeing it live you can adjust it to the composition that you want and then when you're ready you just either uh, uh, trip the shutter on the camera you can use a uh, shutter release cord or you can do it right here from your computer either by clicking on this button or using the hotkey the f12 the function 12 key is the hot key for tripping the shutter. All right, and once you click it, and what happened? My phone off. Oh, won't you know it? Hold on one second. It's on, it's on, it's on. That's on. That's on. It looks like everything else is on. All right, let's give that another try. All right, I have it on timer because I was playing with this. For some reason, sure. My flash. All right, let's let's try turning live view off. Nope. All right, for some reason it doesn't want to work. All right, I'm not going to troubleshoot. My battery might be low. It's been my my uh, my radio trigger's been on for a while now. I might have killed the battery. So, 
I'm not going to bother with that, but you get the gist of it. You can use the live view to uh, make your arrangements, uh, come back and, and take photos, and it just speeds up your process a lot more. Um, like I said, you can use it for um, doing selfies, and I did, I did one earlier. Like I said, I was playing around with this system and I did, I did this, all right? And uh, I'm able to, you know, turn the screen towards me, get myself in position, make sure that, you know, everything's looking good. And I am really lagging here on my, on my system. Give it a second to catch up. There it is. All right. So you can see, uh, like I said, turn the screen towards you, get yourself in position. Uh, and then once you're ready, you just, uh, I had a, um, a remote on a timer. Uh, I actually put it underneath my leg. It's, it's my, my timer is underneath this leg here. Uh, and you can, Take all the selfies you want. So there's no need to be bouncing back and forth between, you know, the, the camera and your seat. You can do it all uh, uh, a little easier now, okay? If you do tabletop photography, like I said, you don't have to be running from your setup to behind the camera. So it makes it a lot nicer. And hopefully it'll come out for Nikon, Sony, and Fuji uh sometime soon okay all right any questions on that aspect that's that's pretty straightforward okay the uh other big issue uh not issue the other big change that came about uh in this update is they got rid of split toning in favor of a color gradient color gradient um uh setup all right and so if if you've ever used split toning uh the the basic principle of, of split toning is that you can tint the shadow or the highlight areas of your image so if you want to make something a little cooler or a little warmer uh, in the shadows or in the highlights, you can do that with split toning. Um, split toning is uh, uh, used, you know, just to give a little bit of mood to your images. Well, with the integration of uh, a lot of video uh, nowadays, um, uh, video uses what's called color grading and color grading is basically the same thing but color grading takes it a little bit step further where you're not only dealing with the the two ends the the shadows and the highlights but you're also dealing with midtones and that's what they did in this particular update is they got rid of the uh, the traditional split toning and replaced it with color grading. So with color grading, you have uh, three wheels. Let me see if I can make this a little bit larger here. All right, you have three wheels, uh, which is your shadows, your midtones, and your highlights. All right. Now, if you're saying, well, you know, I have all these images that I had toned with, you know, my, uh, the, the old version of split toning, what happens to that? Well, the good thing is that all those settings carry over into this new system because we still have the same fundamentals of uh, split toning with the shadows and the highlights. What they've done is they just added a third 
level or third layer which targets your midtones. So the nice thing is anything you've done with the uh, split toning in the past is still preserved, all right? Because you still have access to the shadows and to the highlights. As a matter of fact, if, um, well, uh, I'll show you how they, uh, how it interacts uh, when I explain what these do, all right? So you have across the top, you, the, uh, the first view is the three-way view, which displays the three um, color targets in, in this kind of like pyramid shape, okay? This allows you to play with all three target areas at the same time. And it's okay. The only problem is that uh, depending on the size of your screen, these can be rather small. So fine tuning it can be a little tricky, all right? Uh, this is a great way of being able to get in the ballpark of what you want, all right? And then switching over to the next section, which are the individuals, all right? So the next section, we have our shadows, our midtones, and our highlights, okay? And as you can see, once this, once you click on these, the uh, target selection becomes larger, all right? And you also have access to uh, a legacy feature here, all right? If you click on this, you're gonna see this little color palette, all right? It's very similar to that color palette that you opened up in the uh, split toning, all right, for your highlights and shadows. So you still have that available, all right? The thing is, with this color wheel, uh, it just makes it a little bit easier to, to be able to select that, that perfect hue and the, just the right saturation for your particular image, all right? And the way it works is right in the center is uh, pure white. So it's neutral. It's, it's literally no color, all right? When you click on it and drag it around, is that little target moves up center? The color wheel. All right. Give my display a second to catch up here. All right. And uh, this wheel is the traditional. Uh, RGB CMY gradient that you're familiar with. Uh, previously, it was in a long horizontal strip. What they've done is they basically just wrapped it into a circle. All right. So the the layers. A little. Uh, indicator outside of the circle that kind of goes along. All right. This allows you to pick on the outside. Notice I am manipulating my shadows. And up in the center part, the working area, I have a gradient. Let me just reset this back to, to neutral. I have a gradient going from 100% black to 100% white. Uh, the top is a smooth gradient. The bottom one is a stepped gradient, all right, with this middle one being our middle gray. All right, so as I manipulate my shadows, you can see. All right. 
you can see that the intensity of that gradient uh, is very strong all the way on the left-hand side. And as it comes across to the right-hand side, as it gets lighter and lighter, that uh, influence of, of that pink tone gets less and less and less. All right, until we get over here and it's almost imperceptible. Okay. So this is our shadow areas. All right. Now, if you notice, it's not influencing the solid black at all, simply because solid black is solid black. You cannot get uh any darker or any more color or any more saturated than a hundred percent black all right but everything below that in our deep deep shadows it's going to start picking up that tint right. now as, uh get to center less saturation you have of whatever color that you picked as we the stronger the saturation becomes all right and like if you want to manipulate your saturation uh without affecting the hue uh really close to that line you're gonna remain adjust your saturation all right but if you really want to guarantee it we have two options we have the shift key and we have the control key or command key for those of you who are on a Mac and uh, on a Mac. The shift key will lock it move away from that line. It's going to lock my hue. I, I cannot but a shift key depress stray away from that hue. All right. However, if I say well, I kind of like the saturation, but I'm not too keen on the color, all right? You can come out here to this uh, little selector here, or what you can do is you can at any point press and hold the control or the uh, control uh, command key and you'll notice this ring appears and if you press and hold the shift key it locks so those are two nifty little uh uh, advanced features that you can use just to kind of uh, fine tune your color. Below that, we have uh, several sliders. I'm going to talk about the blending and the balance first. All right, the blending basically just how much of that toning is being blended into your image. When you bring it all the way down to zero, you can notice that the, the, uh, the influence of that color isn't that strong. As we bring it across, right, and the default is only 50 for this, as we bring it across to 100, well, you'll notice that the influence uh, gets stronger and stronger, meaning that it's going to creep into the lighter and lighter tones a little bit more, all right? But 
even though it, it travels into lighter tones, it's not really moving across. It's just becoming more prevalent. It's already there in these mid-tones and slightly lighter tones. All right. It's just that uh, brings it out. the balance. All right. A particular color to a certain area. All right. So by default, it's at zero, and you're going to be able to go negative or positive. You go to the negative side, you can notice that it really, really travels across well into the light areas. All right. And that color tone is going to influence a lot more of your light section along with the dark sections. So even though this is a shadow toning, all right. By bringing the balance all the way to negative 100, you can see that it really, really encroaches into the uh, light tones uh, of the gradient. However, you notice that it's really not affecting that pure 100% white, okay? It, you, the color into, let's say, for example, your mid the extreme dark areas, all right? And notice that the, uh, the influence is a lot more subtle because uh, black tends to kind of muddy things up a little bit, okay? All right. uh, when you start mixing your tones, you have to watch for that in particular. All right, and I'll show you what I mean later on. All right, so that's that's the basics for blending and balancing. All right, and the one that I really like more is this luminance slider because adding a little bit of light into certain areas. So in this case, uh, we have our shadow area. Uh, up, we are introducing some light into these shadow areas all right and uh, what it's doing is it's it's reducing the black while maintaining the tint all right so it makes that tint come through that black a little bit more prevalent all right remember earlier, black tends to kind of muddy things up this is a great way of reducing that mud or that muddy look, all right? Uh, you bring up your luminance. Every night, right? uh, however, if you want something that's really moody with just a slight touch of, of color influence, then you can bring your luminance um, and your shadows a little bit deeper, all right? And notice that the... Um, the effect of lightening and darkening is not extreme. It's a very short, very small shift. All right. Uh, so it's not really make these drastic lighting changes on your image. All right. It's just to kind of make those colors in those areas pop a little bit more. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? All right, now that's for the shadow areas. Of course, uh, we have our mid-tones and we have our highlights. Let me go uh, straight to the highlights because that's kind of like what you've been used to with um, the split toning. And just like the shadows, the highlight areas allow to uh, influence with a very specific now, the most common type of split toning that a lot of people use, especially if you do, uh, if you've done landscape photography, you tend to put a little bit of blue or cool your shadows down 
you put a little blue into the shadow area, and you tend to warm your highlights up by introducing a little bit of orange or yellow or uh, even red or magenta into the highlight sections. All right. So just like your split toning, this does. Uh, is how much saturation of that particular color you want. Okay. The blending. Okay. And the balance. Okay. And now now behaves because we have uh, color in our shadow and color in our highlights it behaves a lot more like what you were used to with the split toning you know how much of the color do you want to influence okay and of course it's going to be dependent on what it is that you photographed right so that's the traditional shadows highlights blend all right with the new color grading they've introduced a third one and this targets our mid-tones now obviously this is going to be something that you use according to your likes okay and uh you know some people can argue you know well i can do everything I need to with my midtones just by controlling how much influence my shadows and my highlights have over that middle section. And yes, absolutely. All right. However, if you want to introduce a third color into the mix, this is where you can do that. And you can say, Hey, I want to introduce maybe, uh, really contrasting color to my uh, uh cool and warm or you can do something that says well i use blue in my shadows i used yellow in my highlights let me pick some little maybe a magenta all right so now we can have a smoother transition in the midtones from blue to yellow or blue to orange all right uh depending on what hue you decide to use for tones and just like your shadows and highlights you can control and how much it influences those okay and then of course you can uh tune on these now i mentioned at the very beginning that the three the the three wheel view is a little awkward to use all right uh however this is where because you're looking at the overall image this is where i would suggest starting to at least set your colors kind of in the general area that you want them to be because it allows you to manipulate all three without having to bounce them, uh, from one screen to another you can have a look at your overall image make your, your adjustments and say okay well, i'd rather have a little bit more purple in my shadows uh, and maybe you know a little more yellow in my highlights and something in my midtones, all right. Uh, and what you have here is adjustments, okay. Uh, and of course, you have your okay. Once you get it in the ballpark, that's when I would say come into these individual ones and fine tune the exact color that you want, the exact set. You know and and get it looking the way you want all right the other suggestion i would say is 
you know, uh, if you can maybe uh, back out uh, a little bit away from your image so it's not taking up the full screen. Sometimes backing it off a little bit helps you see that balance a little bit better, okay? All right. So that's the, the three uh, color wheels. The, the last one, if you notice, that little icon has uh, black, middle gray, and white in the little icon. And this is a global tint. This gets applied on top of everything else across the board over everything. All right, so you can think of this more like a Instagram filter, all right? And this will allow you to, you know, uh, warm it up to a specific tone, cool it off to a specific tone, um, but still have the underlying uh, uh, individual areas influencing that overall tone okay this is something that i i don't see myself using a lot because i'm not me personally i'm not a big fan of you know like the instagram filter look i i've never really liked it uh i do like more of a su a very subtle controlled influence in you know uh my highlights midtones and shadows you know, especially for landscape photography. Uh, and I even use it for some, you know, portrait photography. Uh, but this global one, I, me personally, I don't see myself using it. But you know what? Play around with it. Maybe you'll, you'll find a use for it. Or maybe you'll say, hey, you know, I kind of like this look. Uh, and of course, you have the, um, okay? Any questions on this so far? Let me, uh, any questions that I can answer so far? All right. What I'll probably do is, is I, I got a couple of images. Wow. My, my feed's really lagging here. I don't know what's going on. Hey, there we go. Oh, no, I'm frozen. <laughs> Sorry guys, I don't know what's going. Oh, there we go. Now, now we've caught up. Okay. All right, let's go back to the, my uh, Lightroom, and here's a, a recent photo I took. It's a nice foliage. Um, playing around with my brand new 50 millimeter lens that I bought, and oh man, what is with this lagging? There we go. There we go. Okay. So we have this uh, uh, nice fall colors. All right. But I would like to see some of this pop. You know, I want to influence these, the, the uh, colors that were captured in camera. I want to just bring them out. Now, we can go to our basic panel and we can bring the, uh, well, in this. I brought up the vibrance a little bit. Brought up the vibrance. Uh, you can see saturation, but you know, sometimes saturation makes it look a little bit too fake. Right? So, this is where we can go into our uh, color gradient and say, you know what? I want to find a nice balance between highlighting these, you know, uh, awesome fall colors. Uh, without them getting too far uh, out of whack where the whole image looks kind of like this overall warm tone, all right? So by being able to introduce cool tones into the shadows, uh, some of those, that, that overwhelming orange-yellow, uh, uh, bright green look, okay? I'm going to bring in a little blue into my shadows. All right. And actually here, let me go to here. Okay. 
And in my highlights, I'm going to bring uh, in some like warm orange. Notice here in the in the green tones, it's it's really making it look more fall like, right? Uh, and these trees along the top, uh, the red is definitely popping a little bit more. Okay, and now here we can bring uh, a little green back into mid tones, right? Because we have a lot of mid tone colors in this green foliage here, all right? Uh, you can see that I, I'm bringing back some of that green, and if I want to influence that, be a little bit more yellow, or I make it a, a deeper green, which obviously this definitely makes it look fake because it's breaking away from that fall look. Let's bring it over into a little bit more of that yellow, maybe not so saturated. All right. Uh, maybe a little bit more influence on the blue. All right. So being able to bounce through these three, give it a second to catch up. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what's, what's going on here. Come on, catch up. There we go. Being able to bounce between these three uh, uh, selectors allows me to move fairly quickly and getting fairly close to the look that I want. Once I have a look in the way I, I like, I can then go into each individual one and say, okay, now I want a very specific hue for my shadows. All right, and this is driving me nuts because it's not refreshing as. Give me one second. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'll be able to. Do anything now. Um. Let's let's give one thing a try. If everybody can turn off their their cameras, you'll still be able to see and hear me, but maybe we can uh control some of this lag. See if if uh that helps. All right. Of course I won't be able to see your reactions, but you know, hopefully you'll Nope, doesn't look like it's working all that that much. All right, I apologize, guys. I I really don't know how to control that lag right now. Um, I don't know what's causing it. I'll have to get down to the into the bowels of the program, but. Um, but anyhow, uh, as I mentioned before, you can fine tune your specific color uh, with these large, the larger selectors. All right. You can say, okay, I want a little bit more of the bright green and my highlights, I want a little more orange and so on. All right. And then it just makes it pop. And of course, just like before, you have the little toggle that allows you to turn the uh, effect on and off, on and off. All right, so you can see how what you did affects your image. Or you can do a before and after uh, side by side view. And of course, now I got to wait for the lag here. I can just imagine how frustrating this must be for you guys. I apologize. I'm going to have to find some kind of solution for this because this 
This is this is horrible. There we go. All right. So you can always do a before and after preview. And you can see how we uh, we wrestled that kind of like bright green and uh, we made it a little bit more of that uh, kind of yellow green color uh, uh, rather than that, you know, Kelly green. Okay. And the uh, the reds became a little bit more magenta in relation to what was original. Originally, it, it looked very red. Uh, we got a little bit more magenta and a little bit of a brighter look. Uh, and our shadows, you can see uh, like in the post and in the uh, bench here, how it went from this kind of like uh, warm black color to a cool black color, All right? So uh, by introducing that, that cool color, it just helps balance against all that warm color, All right? Okay. Let me go back to my original view. All right, so that's the gradient tool. The uh, other things that were changed uh, within Lightroom are fairly, uh, fairly minor, all right? One of the things that they did is the zoom feature, uh, being able to zoom in and out. Uh, if you remember previously, I, I don't know if uh, you can see it, but uh, up in the navigator where you have your preview window, Let me switch back in the preview window. Uh, right above it uh, were three little, uh, let me take my, turn that off. All right, right above the preview window, uh, you have a little drop down that says fit or fill. I usually keep it to fit because I want the image to kind of just fit whatever the workspace is. And then right next to it is your percentage, all right? Your zoom per percentage, all right? And you can zoom in to 100%. Uh, this would be your pixel peeping setting. And then uh, right next to that, it used to be ratios, one to one, two to one, three to one, four to one, eight to one, all right? Uh, which, you know, it always confused me because I never zoomed in based on ratios. Whenever I zoomed in, I always like by percentage. And that is what they decided to do. They, they changed it to be able to view by percentage. So you can zoom in at 200% or you can zoom, zoom out uh, 50%. 12%, okay? All right, so this is a great place to be when you're doing your color grading because you can see the overall uh, against a neutral background. The other things they added is that uh, if you remember, if you wanted to zoom in and out, all you gotta do is tap on the, the image and it's going to toggle between your what you have in the first setting your fit to what you had previously but now instead of having to come up here to make your selection uh, from the drop down you can use what's called a scrubby zoom right and the way that works is again you can use your shift or your control all right uh, shift key allows you to do a scrubby meaning that when you press the shift key all right let me actually go to my 100 percent where is it 
now it doesn't want to work. Why doesn't it want to work? It was working before, now it doesn't want to work. The shift key would allow you to, to, uh, you know, sometimes I hate my life when something works off screen, you're like getting everything ready and it says, okay, I'm good to go. You go live and it doesn't want to cooperate. All right. The other one is control key. Your control or command key on the Mac allows you to draw a marquee around whatever you want to zoom into so when you let go it'll zoom to that particular section all right and why is my scrubby zoom not working oh i think i know why because i am not in the development that's why see look at that in the develop module all right if you want to zoom in you press and hold the shift key all right the cursor changes to a magnifying glass with two little side arrows and you're able to uh move your mouse or your cursor left and right uh to zoom in and zoom out okay the control key you're able to draw your marquee and zoom into whatever you happen to select okay so this allows you to really navigate through uh your uh different zoom levels a lot better okay all right so that's the zoom feature uh, the other things that they did is they made uh, the editing with brushes and gradients work a little bit faster, All right? Uh, if you had a fast computer, you may not see any difference, but if your computer is a little bit on the slow side, you may notice uh, an improvement on the brushes and the uh, gradient and radio filters in your local adjustments all right i said um it's just a performance um uh, any kind of new exciting feature all right and uh that's pretty much it as far as what they did to lightroom with this particular uh update all right, so the major enhancements was they added live view for Canon shooters and they added the gradient uh, for uh, uh, to replace your split toning. All right, and that's it for updates to Lightroom. I'll open it up to any questions anybody may have in regarding any of the th stuff that we covered. All right. Or if you happen to have a question that's not related to what we covered, maybe something else. So floor is yours. Like a general Zoom question. I, I'm getting a very low resolution feed. I can't read screen. And what I'm doing is I'm listening to you, but then trying to my own version of Lightroom on my own computer. Is, is there something I've got set up wrong? Or, or is the resolution just poor tonight? Uh, I don't know. I'm having a lot of trouble on my end as well. Uh, so it may be something with internet service. Um, it, it may be slow overall because of, of the, uh, the high winds we've been having lately. So like I said, it, it's going to be something that I have to look into on my end see if I can somehow fix it. Uh, but I do apologize for the inconvenience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, un unfortunately, that's not anything that I can quite control by manipulating a few sliders on my end here. <laughs> so, but hopefully the playback uh, when it goes live to YouTube will be a lot better and cleaner, so.
because uh, I am recording this and it will be uploaded uh, later uh, tonight. Okay. Any other questions? I have a few other Lightroom questions. Sure. Related. Um, yeah, I, I posted a question online. I saw that you responded to it. it got this message when I was trying to. And actually, that was a Photoshop. Um, saying my scratch disk reflection. Oh, yes. Even yeah. Is that similar to what you were saying some time ago where I've got so much stuff on my desktop? Stuff? Uh, no, no. Uh, the. The thing with the desktop situation is um, the way Windows works and the way that um, uh, Apple works, anything that is on a desktop, uh, Windows kind of looks at it as a ready to use area, all right? So anything that gets put on your desktop has memory allocated in your, uh, in your read-only memory or, or random access memory, okay? Uh, because this is very fast access uh, memory. So that means that at a click of a button, whatever you have on your desktop is going to open up very, very quickly because it's, it's kind of preloaded into memory. Now, depending on the size of that memory will determine how many of those programs get, get, you know, uh, uh, flagged for that ready access. So what happens is that takes up a lot of memory resource for the short-term memory, okay? So I always tell people, you know, if you wanna make your, your desktop run a little bit faster, clear out all that stuff because people tend to put stuff that they sometimes use up there just so that it's in their face, all right? And, and it tends to be a very bad habit because all that's doing is it's robbing your system of critical memory that can be used for something else, right? Now, that kind of memory is uh, uh, always changing depending on what it is that you're doing on your computer. So if you have, for example, if you're working on a text document, all right, the auto saves, all right, as you go along, gets dumped into this memory. When you uh, uh, put in a picture that, you know, gets dumped into that memory. So that's everything that you're doing in the program happens very, very quickly. And you don't see too much of a lag because it's, it's reading that direct instant access memory, okay? And of course, now that you understand that, you can see how if there's other programs also dipping into this memory, whatever you're doing with, you know, your text document, all that other stuff is going to slow it down. All right. Now, uh, the way a graphics program works, it's a little bit different. Yes, the majority of, of the action uh, is going to be handled by that memory because it's, you know, all about the interface and the buttons and the moving of elements on the screen, okay? But a lot of the heavy, heavy duty stuff, especially with graphics, gets allocated to the memory in your graphics card, all right? So that's why I always recommend if you do any kind of uh, digital painting, photography, film work, or anything that is very graphic heavy with your machine, splurge a little bit and get a more robust graphics card because it's gonna be able to handle all that heavy duty uh, uh, graphics manipulation a lot easier, all right? Um, especially now that we're getting into 
uh, 3D rendering and uh, all these, you know, AIs and, and multi layers and things like that. So you need a good graphics processor to, to really get the bulk of it, all right? However, in the background, what's happening is uh, your program will use you know that random access memory but it's got limits usually it's you know it's a small amount it's allocated for the programs because these programs are so heavy duty and intensive it says a hey, we need to partition a section of your hard drive as a temporary read and write memory allocation all right, so whatever your RAM memory can't handle, it's going to send it to your hard drive into that temporary space. And uh, because it's, it's a space that can be allocated to your, the, the needs of, of the machine, that space can grow or, you know, they can use more or less of it. However, if you go into the preferences, you'll see that uh, uh, you can set how much actual physical disk space you are going to allocate to Photoshop, all right? And basically what it says is uh, it says, okay, Windows, we're going to take this amount of memory from this, uh, the hard drive, and we're gonna reserve it for our use, okay? But of course, Windows has to do a balancing game between what they consider temporary use memory to long-term memory. And the long-term memory would be saving your files, saving your images, saving your documents, your text, uh, and all that other stuff. The more you save, the smaller and smaller those free areas become. And because Photoshop is using that free area and it wants a fairly heavy duty section of that free area, when you start filling up your hard drive, that allocatable area becomes smaller and smaller. And now Photoshop now has to do a juggling act of what it stores there what it stores in random access memory and what it stores in long-term memory. And it becomes a, a juggling act that really, really binds up the, uh, the program and slows it down, okay? When it gets to a critical point, Photoshop will say, hey, dude, you don't have enough space. I quit, I give up, I can't do anything, all right? Uh, and that's when you should go in and really do a cleanup on your disk. Get rid of anything that you don't use. Uh, make backups to a secondary drive of stuff that you don't use. Uh, and just free up that main hard drive. All right. So uh, I've talked about it in the past. One of the things that I do with my personal system is I have multiple drives. All right, and I tend to keep my main drive. Uh, I, I try not to bog it down too much because that's what I use for my scratch disks, not only for Photoshop, but for any other program that requires that kind of service. Long-term storage, I will put on a secondary drive. All right, and like in this machine, I have a two terabyte and a four terabyte drive um, in addition to my one terabyte main drive. So I, I try to keep that main drive free so that my programs run smoothly and it's not you know choking for, for uh, memory space, okay? Laptops are a different story. Some laptops only have one drive uh, I have the luxury of having a laptop with two drives, but even those drives are, uh, you know, they're limited. So 
uh, I have to really play that balancing act of what I keep on my laptop and what I send off to you know an external storage. So basically, your computer is telling you it needs a cleanup. <laughs> Pretty much. So hopefully that explained it. Speaking, speaking of cleaning up, um, I don't think I've ever deleted any of my Lightroom backups. I'm not sure where they are actually, but okay. Uh, but I can I can probably get rid of like tons of that stuff. Uh, well, you're gonna you're gonna free up some space by getting rid of old catalogs. Yes. All right, but. One thing that I find a lot of people do is that uh, photographers tend to hang on to a lot more of their images than they really need to. All right. I, I and it's it's second nature. You know, um, part of it is that what if scenario that we play in our heads. The other one is pure laziness. You know, it gets dumped into a folder. That folder, you know, goes into history. And we tend to forget about it, you know, until the day that we stumble across it and say, oh, look at these pictures from way back when. And then you go, oh. <laughs> but what I suggest is every so often, before time gets on too far, go back to some of these older photo uh, folders and delete the photos that you know you're not going to use all right because by th by the time you've done all your editing and your uh um selecting you've picked out the best of the best of that group and if you know you're like me i will shoot three four five different versions of the same exact scene, all right? But only one of those is gonna be the very best. The others are just gonna sit there taking up space because in our heads, we're saying, eh, what if? But that what if usually never comes. So I've gotten to the habit of being a little bit more brutal with my editing and then just deleting the stuff that I, I, you know, if I have three or four version, I'll keep the very best one, delete everything else. Because by, you know, two years down the road, if those three or four others have not seen the light of day, they never will. Now, please don't tell my wife this because she'll force me to go down into my basement and do the same thing with the shelves in the basement. And I'm terrible with that. <laughs> so that's uh, my tip for house cleaning. Uh, so to find where your, um, your catalog is, all right? When you go to Lightroom, uh, you go to uh, edit, you come down and it'll say catalog settings. All right, and the shortcut is control alt comma control alt comma or control uh what is it for mac control option or command option comma something like that all right when you click on that it's going to bring up this dialog box and you'll say uh right there it says location the name of your catalog all right and when it was created, when it was last backed up, uh, when it was optimized, and the size of it, okay? Uh, and then of course, right below it, uh, this is something that you should you know, look into. How often does your system back up your catalog, all right? And it's gonna back it up to your, you know, the same location, all right? Uh, but where it says location off to the side you're going to see a little button that says show click on that and it's going to open up your file browser all right 
and there's my Lightroom. I click on that, and here are uh, all my Lightroom catalog stuff, all right? My, my smart previews, um, all right, that one there, all right, and that one there I can probably get rid of, all right, because if you notice, all the new stuff now has version 10 appended to the end, all right? So here's my old catalog, LR working, that's what I call it, my working catalog, all right? Uh, previously, no extension after it. The new one, it took the name and just added V10, all right? So here we have our, um, uh, our subfolders, our working helper, and our smart previews, all right? Those two along with that is my old catalog. All right. Once I'm satisfied that Lightroom is behaving properly and it's not going to, you know, corrupt anything, I'll go and delete these three. All right. If you see more than this on your system, all right, uh, you know, anything that says version six, version eight, version nine, whatever, however, you know, your your files were named previously. Uh, you can probably go ahead and delete them, all right? To double check, just look at the date modified. If you see something that's two, three, four years old, you know, probably safe to assume that they're not needed, all right? But they're gonna be named according to your catalog name. And the catalog ends with L-R-C-A-T, L-R-C-A-T extension, which is Lightroom Catalog, all right? While we are here, I am going to give everybody that's listening a little clue. When you open up Lightroom, Lightroom is going to create a temporary file named after your uh, catalog, and it's going to put a uh, dot l-o-c-k lock extension to it all right and it's a small little one kilobyte file it's a temporary file when you close lightroom that file typically disappears there will be on occasion where you can't get lightroom to open for some reason or you open it and Lightroom just is not behaving the way it should, all right? Look to see, all right, when you close everything out, check this folder, all right? If you still see the L-O-C-K file after you've closed everything down, delete it and Lightroom will be able to open up uh, properly the next time all right so that's a little doesn't happen too often it has happened on a couple occasions for me in the in the you know years i've had lightroom uh and it's a simple easy fix close everything down get rid of that lock file and then reopen lightroom and you should be uh back in normal operation okay all right so that's where you find your uh, working folder, all right? Now, you can rename your Lightroom uh, catalogs if you want, all right, like, uh, like I did, all right? Uh, if you do, make sure you rename all these folders as well, all right? Otherwise, you're going to break it. All right, it'll probably recreate a new folder and uh, start duplicating stuff and you don't wanna do that. So if you decide, you know, you're gonna rename your folder, or I mean, uh, I'm sorry, your catalog, all right, make sure that these subfolders get renamed as well, all right, so that they all match. All right, and that's that. If that scares you, don't touch it. <laughs> leave it as this okay all right so any other questions
No other questions? We're good? All right. Uh, if at any point, you, you know, just so you know, if at any point you guys run into a problem and you can't uh, get out of it, you can always email me. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Or like uh, Mark did, you know, drop a, a comment in the Facebook page. And, uh, you know, obviously when I log into Facebook, if I see it, I will give you my answer. Okay. Um, also, if uh, you aren't a member of uh, Photo Mentoris, I suggest checking it out. Uh, it's a community of photographers. It's a small community. It's a, a forum-based community. Uh, you can always ask questions there, uh, and hopefully somebody will come along that knows the answer and can give you uh, the answer that you need. Uh, obviously, because it's a forum, it's a little bit slower, uh, but you know it's a great way of uh, getting feedback on your images, uh, getting answers to questions, uh, maybe not questions that are critical, but you know uh, any questions that you may have that you would like an answer to, and I should be in the chat here. Um, you know, I suggest checking it out. It's free to register, free to participate. Um, I hang out there every so often. I'm not very active. I do give critiques on images on Photomentoris. I don't really critique images on Facebook. Um, so if you want to improve your photography and you say, well, you know, I have this image. I don't know what to do with it. I need to take it to the next level. Post it to the forum. I'll be more than happy to uh, give my opinion. Uh, others will give their opinions as well. There's also tutorials on there. Uh, I have a bunch of tutorials that I've published. Other photographers have tutorials that they've published. Um, I don't know um, how many tutorials, but we, we got quite a few. Uh, and of course, if, if you want to learn something, I'll be more than happy to write up a tutorial. Uh, just to put into the forum as well. Okay, so I invite you photomentoris.com uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see you there. All right, if there are no further questions, uh, once again, what I'd like to do is, uh, let me switch over to here. Uh, don't forget the end of the month, I'm doing a um, workshop on uh you know working with models right it's geared i'm i'm targeting both groups not just photographers i'm going to be talking to the photographers and i'm going to be talking to the models all right uh letting them know what the proper etiquettes are some insight of how to communicate um uh, how to keep things safe in this you know quarantine uh era and things like that so um stay tuned for that uh also next next monday uh it will be all about the um the updates that were done to photoshop and let me tell you they did some heavy duty really cool stuff with this latest uh update to photoshop so hopefully you'll join me uh next monday all right and of course in the meantime if you have any general photography questions the third monday i'll be more than happy to answer any of those whether it's camera or lighting or whatever it is that is hanging you up okay awesome guys uh if there are no other questions anybody want to share anything what's going on uh in your area No? All right. I appreciate you coming out and hang out with me on this Monday. And hopefully we'll see you next Monday. In the meantime, be safe. Keep shooting.
have fun, all right? And don't forget to practice. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for watching Learning Photography with Duck. Brought to you in association with Milford Photo, your local full service.